Uh, hello, I'm uh, Thomas Hazlett, Professor of Law and Economics here at George Mason University. And as Director of the Information Economy Project, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, for today's exciting program with Thomas Krottenmacher. Uh, I'd uh, first uh, like to start by thanking Gordon Tullock, our colleague here, whose generous grant makes this lecture series, the Tullock Lecture, possible. Uh, and I'd like to alert everybody to our next program, <clears throat> a rather remarkable an entrepreneur, Jeff Sandifer, uh, who has uh, turned his sights uh, to uh, the educational market, has started something called the Acton School of Business, uh, which is uh, uh, an amazing success story on its own in Austin, Texas. But he's now turning his sights on uh, primary education in America and, and is uh, going to tell us uh, something about how to use technology in the classroom. That's, uh, that's really quite a big ticket item that we haven't we haven't really cracked yet, and uh, we've wasted a lot of billions on it, and there have been a lot of false starts. Um, but uh, Sandifer is one of the most interesting and provocative uh, thinkers and doers in the education field in America today. So if you do have a chance, please join us November 14th, uh, right here, uh, 4 p.m., for the uh, Tulloch Lecture. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, note that there will be a lecture uh, there will be a Q&A session uh, towards the end of the lecture, and then about 5.30, we will break for a, uh, a reception, which is down below in the atrium. And uh, you're certainly all invited, and uh, it's, a, it's a little advance notice that if you don't get at Professor Krottenmacher during this session, you will be held hostage down in the atrium immediately following. You get another shot at him. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Fernando LaGuarda, who's uh, with Time Warner Cable and is a scholar in his own right. I know him from the tele uh, uh, TPRC, Telecommunications Policy Research Conference, uh, where we're uh, on the board together and uh, uh, his many activities in the uh, telecommunications policy field uh, are well known to many of you. And he has the introduction for our speaker today. Fernando? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm, I'm delighted to join you here today uh, to introduce my friend and mentor, Tom Kratmaker. Uh, Tom is currently enjoying his latest uh, retirement, although in Tom's case, that obviously involves a great deal of writing, thinking, playing basketball, and of course, sharing his opinions. Um, I've known Tom since I was his law student. Uh, sometimes he still makes me feel like a student in a good way. Um, he's gracious, unfailingly polite, but of course with a sharp mind and intellect you would expect from a former Supreme Court clerk and influential academic. A graduate of Swarthmore College and Columbia University Law School, Tom has enjoyed a distinguished and productive career in academia, government, and the private sector. From the University of Connecticut to Georgetown Law Center to the law school at William & Mary, the Mintz Levin Law Firm, the Wilson Sonsini Law Firm with stints at the Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Communications Commission, as well as multiple retirement parties in between. Tom has written dozens of articles on everything from the rules of evidence to, to civil rights to the rule of reason, as well as books on regulation uh, and the leading textbook on telecommunications law and policy, one that I got to use when it was still in mimeograph form. Today we are here to address, to hear Tom address one of his favorite topics, freedom of expression. Not freedom as construed under the First Amendment necessarily because that would mean accepting what the judicial branch and for our purposes, most importantly, what the Supreme Court would have to say about that freedom. I'm sure that for Tom, it's the freedom that matters first and foremost. Tom's topic today is a reflection on the Supreme Court's postmodern approach to First Amendment jurisprudence and specifically the subject of broadcast speech. Broadcasters have always been privileged speakers in the sense that they receive many privileges from the government in order to speak. Of course, as Tom will remind us, in the famous Pacifica case, the Supreme Court approved a ban on indecent radio broadcasts and open the door to content regulation of this medium, not on the basis of its many privileges, 
but on the basis of its unique ability to reach into the home and invade the space reserved for children. That was not so much of a privilege. I can still hear Tom chuckling about the court's rationale when he taught the case to me. He and Justice Stevens didn't see eye to eye, maybe. In the Fox case, which is the subject of Tom's lecture, the court ignored the opportunity to come to terms with vast changes in media since Pacifica and instead vacated FCC and decency orders against broadcasters on vagueness grounds, leaving the FCC free to continue to target indecent broadcast programming. Not the expected outcome, at least for me. Was it an indulgent approach to government censorship? Was it the right approach to take with respect to a privileged speaker? Did the court turn a blind eye to the FCC's exercise of unprincipled regulatory power? Is any broadcast indecency policy feasible, and is the FCC capable of administering such a regime? If Tom doesn't answer these questions, we'll get to them later. <laughs> Some ground rules, as Tom Hazlett set out. Tom will speak for about an hour and then take questions. Um, hold your questions until the end, and I'll help call on you. Um, Tom will stay for refreshments and obviously be happy to continue chatting forever about his topic. Without further ado, please welcome Tom Kratmaker. I'm on. <laughs> Fernando, thank you. Um, the answer to Fernando's questions, the answers to Fernando's questions are no, no, yes, no, and no. Um, <laughs> if any <clears throat> of you would like to stay and hear the details, I'll get into them pre presently. <laughs> um, for the sins I'm about to commit up here um, in subjecting you to all manner of um, indecent and offensive language, all I can say is the First Amendment made me do it. Um, <laughs> thanks. Most especially to George Mason uh, University and law school for having me here. Um, I, it's I'm particularly honored to have uh, my good friend and colleague Tom Hazlett sponsor this thing, and to be here under the auspices of something named after uh, Gordon Tullock is 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 indeed an honor. Uh, I don't do economics, although I am a fellow traveler with some economists. <laughs> so I'm going to try to talk not just about the First Amendment, but a little bit about some institutional policy issues. And I'm not going to try to do economics while I do this. And I also can't avoid commenting on the fact that it's really nice to see a lot of former colleagues and students here. So very, very, you know, very good of you to come. Um, why anybody would turn out to see Tommy OneNote, I don't know, because you guys already know what I'm going to say. <laughs> I guess you love it so much, <laughs> you just can't get enough of it. Well, anyway, here we go. If you don't have the handout already, um, I've tipped my hand at the beginning. Um, this is supposed to be a lecture series on big ideas in information policy. So I told Tom I would try to think of, of some big ideas, and I thought of four. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And if you don't have a copy, if you just put your hand up, uh, my lovely and talented assistant, Brent, will bring you a copy of the four big ideas um, that, uh, that we're going to talk about today. Um, each of the ideas that I want to talk about um, stems from my thinking about a string of regulatory failures. And all the failures that I want to discuss today stem from one incident that occurred 100 years ago. Um, what happened 100 years ago? Well, you may remember this. In 1912, the Titanic sank. Uh, the tragedies, of course, were the loss of all those lives. Uh, but at the same time, uh, as a consequence of the Titanic sinking, we suffered a regulatory tragedy. The federal government believing that chaos among radio operators on the East Coast had contributed to rescue ships arriving late to the Titanic sinking site, seized the broadcast airways and shortly began to a program to control not only who utilized the electromagnetic spectrum, but what could be said over it. It all started with the Radio Act of 1912. Um, that act 
uh, sort of feel here a little bit like I'm reading you part of Genesis, but the 1912 Radio Act begat the Federal Radio Commission Act of 1927, which begat the Federal Communications Act of 1934, which begat uh, the decision in FCC versus Fox. Uh, decided in June 1912, uh, June, excuse me, 2012, when the Supreme Court of the United States decided um, the latest, certainly not the last, in a series of federal court reviews of the commission's attempts to keep indecent programming off the airwaves. Um, that, in a nutshell, is what we're going to talk about today. And as the old commercial might say, we've come a long way, baby from the sinking of the Titanic to the flaunting of bare buttocks on NYPD blues. Um, in Fox, all in just one small century. Can you imagine what's ahead in the next hundred years? <laughs> in Fox, I think I'll just keep referring to the opinion as the Fox opinion, uh, the court reviewed several decisions of the FCC, each of which held that a broadcast was indecent because of a brief moment within the telecast. Um, there are two that are simplest to understand, so I'm just going to describe those to you. Because I'm going to operate on the assumption that everybody in the room has had the opportunity to study the Supreme Court's opinion in FCC Fox. I'm going to indulge the further assumption that not all of you have taken that opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so I will try to help you along the way a little bit. Um, the two that are simplest to understand, the first one involves share. Uh, and no, it was not held, as uh, Professor Hazlett suggested, that share was indecent. Um, <laughs> as a product of the 60s myself, I find that suggestion offensive. <laughs> so let's let the fur fly, Tom. <laughs> share is about this. Uh, in 2002, the singer Share received an award at the Billboard Music Awards broadcast live by Fox. She gave an unscripted acceptance speech, and during the course of that, she said, quote, people have been telling me I'm on the way out every year, right? So fuck them. Thus, that was held to be an indecent telecast. Um, the second one I call NYPD, New York Police Department, NYPD Blues. In 2003, the FCC broadcast an episode of NYPD Blues that, as the court put it, quote, showed the nude buttocks of an adult female character for approximately seven seconds and for a moment the side of her breast. Approximately? <laughs> approximately seven seconds? I mean, I don't, was it really like six and a half or seven and a half? Um, Approximately seven seconds, you'll notice, is not the same as a moment. The buttocks were for approximately seven seconds. The buttocks were for a moment. Um, does the phrase anal obsessive come to mind as we review the facts of that case? The character was preparing to take a shower when a child, her boyfriend's son, entered the bathroom. And this is when he discovered that the woman was of more than passing interest to his father. Um, the FCC, in decisions issued in 2004, following on the heels of what's commonly referred to, even in the Supreme Court opinion, as Nipplegate. Do you remember Janet Jackson in the Super Bowl halftime show? It didn't involve seven seconds, but possibly a moment. In fact, I think it was a second and a half of exposure. I think they timed it. Uh, the FCC held both these broadcasts to be indecent. Now, the commission was applying its indecency policy which was explained in a 2001 industry guidance, uh, which I'm hoping it doesn't turn out that someone in this room wrote, <coughs> Chris. Uh, as, and that guidance proscribes broadcasts that, quote, describe or depict sexual or excretory organs or activities, and where the broadcast is patently offensive, quote, patently offensive, as measured by contemporary community standards for the broadcast medium. The guidance further provides that whether something is patently offensive depends on three factors. One, the explicitness or graphic nature of the depiction. Two, whether the material dwells on or repeats at length the depiction. 
and three, whether the material appears to pander, is used to titillate, or is presented for its shock value. Um, now, for those of you um, legal beagles who have been listening very carefully and parsing the relevant words here, Brent, did the, did the microphone just go off? Am I still coming through? Yes, you are. Oh, okay, yeah. You you can you hear me, off? Tim? Can you hear me okay? All right, okay. You want to turn that one off on you? And it's okay. Turn All right. Coming through? Um, <laughs> it's my one claim to fame. 30 years of law teaching. <laughs> Nobody ever said, can you speak? please speak up? We can't hear you in the back. <laughs> that was not an issue. Uh, for, th for those of you who are really parsing this, legal stuff very, very carefully um, in the hopes maybe someday you can become an indecency lawyer. I'd probably better be in a tax lawyer. Um, the commission, yes, it did have to hold that nude female buttocks constitute, quote, sexual or excretory organs. Um, not to mention a moment of bare breast. Um, I think this rule applies to female breast only, but I don't know. So, on review, the Second Circuit found that the FCC's indecency policy was unconstitutionally vague because one could not reasonably guess at what the commission would later hold to be, excuse me, indecent. For example, and it will get a little steamy here, folks, because there's no other way to do this. The commission had also held that bullshit was patently offensive. But, dick, dickhead, pissed off, up yours, kiss my ass, and wiping his ass were not patently offensive. Although the court didn't get into other examples, there was no mention of erectile dysfunction, or ring around the collar, or feminine hygiene deodorant spray as potential indecent phrases either. Um, we could go on all day here. Just this past weekend, while I was still making notes for this talk, I saw a teaser for a network show that had one woman saying to another, your sweater looks like it was produced by a pumpkin mating with a turd. Uh, <laughs> we're probably not all watching that show tonight. <laughs> uh, now, the commission responding to the allegation of vagueness, had tried to introduce some clarity by stating that two words in particular were presumptively indecent at all times. We could, I could say, can you guess what they were, but I'm going to tell you, I'm spoon-feeding this stuff to you, okay? <laughs> I expect high marks on my critiques for this. Um, the, two weeks, the two words that are presumptively indecent are fuck and shit. Um, the agency then, however, took back any clarity that might have provided by providing two exceptions to this rule. Uh, for bona fide news coverage and where a fleeting expletive was, quote, demonstrably essential to the nature of an artistic or educational work or essential to informing viewers on a matter of public importance, unquote. When asked why... You need why the, this is so flexible. The commission said to the Second Circuit, we need a flexible standard to keep broadcasters from finding ingenious, offensive ways to depict sexual or excretory organs or activities. They might have cited this pumpkin <laughs> turd mating thing that was about to come. The Second Circuit, however, just hoisted the commission on its own petard. <laughs> Quote, if the, FTC, if the FCC cannot anticipate what will be considered indecent under its policy, then it can hardly expect broadcasters to do so. <laughs> it must have been so, I, and it's a, I've never been a judge, but I have been a law clerk. It would have been so much fun to write that sentence. <laughs> Those of you that have been clerks before, I'm sure, feel the same way. Um, okay, that's what the Second Circuit did. The Supreme Court vacated these judgments of the Second Circuit in an 18-page opinion that contains not one word criticizing the Second Circuit's decision or explaining what the Second Circuit did wrong. Uh, at the same time, the court held uh, that the network should prevail because the commission failed to give Fox or ABC, excuse me, Quote, the commission failed to give Fox or ABC fair notice prior to the broadcasts in question.
that fleeting expletives and momentary nudity could be found actionably indecent, unquote. Now, for those of you that were following this case when it was up before the court a year ago, um, six months ago, I guess, before the court ruled, to all outside observers, these cases appeared to present a clear clash of values. Is the court going to follow path A or path B? Path A is to reaffirm its non-broadcast precedents that by now rather clearly establish the principle that mere indecent or profane or unseemly or impolite or unpatriotic but not obscene speech was entitled to First Amendment protections. There's a line of cases pretty much unbroken stretching over 40 years now solidly standing for that principle. Or were they going to go down path B to reaffirm the exception to that principle set out in the court's 1978 Pacifica decision that Fernando referred to, that the broadcast of indecent profanity was subject to regulation and proscription by the FCC. That's what people thought the court was going to do, and that's what they, why they thought they took the case, and that's why the stack of amicus briefs is about this high in the case. And rather than address this issue, which clearly explains why the court took the case in the first place, the court, in a terse 18-page opinion that's mostly devoted to just laying out the facts, uh, simply washed its hands of the matters by holding that the commission hadn't provided adequate notice of the agency's intent to include among its list of prohibited indecent materials what are now known by the indecency law scholar bar as fleeting glimpses of nudity or fleeting non-literal expletives. Um, And yes, there will be on the exam a requirement to be able to describe in some detail what constitute fleeting non-literal expletives. And Yes, it is too late to drop the course. Um, Quote, the commission failed to give Fox or ABC fair notice prior to the broadcast in question that fleeting expletives and momentary nudity could be found actionably indecent, unquote. Uh, Accordingly, the networks, which thanks to Pacifica and Red Lion, so far as we know, lack any First Amendment rights, uh, were inexplicably entitled to take refuge in the Fifth Amendment, (laughs) where they apparently do have Fifth Amendment rights, bully for them. Um, Although by now, I suppose, they have been warned, so no more bare buttocks, uh, at least those of the female persuasion. At the same time, they vacated the judgments of the Second Circuit without criticizing in any way the decision of the Second Circuit. The thesis I present to you today is a simple one. I think the court's decision was a cop-out. You can already tell that that's what I think. That failed to establish or reflect any one of four principles that should have been announced or followed in this case. And those principles that I think should have driven this case and been followed are my four big ideas which have already been handed to you. So with that, I will now sit down and take questions. <laughs> Fernando's looking at me saying, no, he knows me better than that, and so is Mark Serini. I will now elaborate at length on those four big ideas. <laughs> um, in order, what should have occurred in Fox, I think, should have reflected these principles. Number one, it's time to declare obsolete. It's been time for a long time, but it's certainly time now. It's the 21st century, for gosh sakes. Um, to declare obsolete two related First Amendment doctrines. I've collapsed them in the little handout. One First Amendment doctrine is that First Amendment law provides different rules for different media. The strongest statement I know of that point of view is in an, uh, an opinion from Chief Justice Berger involving billboard regulation, but it traces its way all the way back to a Supreme Court decision in the 40s dealing with sound trucks. And it recurs over and over in Supreme Court cases. Different rules for different media. No. I mean, why? (laughs) It's the same First Amendment. We have different approaches that depend on whether a restriction is content-related or content-neutral. And also depend on whether the law singles out communications media or broad applicability. But the medium does not and should not determine the rule. Imagine this. If, 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 If the rule were the one I described to you, then it would be at least presumptively wrong to apply the same rule to different media, (laughs) if different media are supposed to have different rules. Um, 
the fundamental principle, it's expressed in Tornillo, but it's also reflected in every other enduring First Amendment case outside the realm of broadcasting and commercial speech, is that editorial control over what is said and how it is said should be lodged in private, not governmental institutions. And on the handout, I gave you three different places where you can go read more about that. Um, an allied doctrine that also deserves to be discarded is that the First Amendment does not fully apply to communications delivered wholly or partially over the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, it seems to me that whether the speech is, whether, excuse me, the regulation is content neutral or content related, the test must be the same regardless of the medium or media employed. That, I think, is an easier point to make in the 21st century, which, if any, national media are not delivered wholly or partially over telecommunications facilities today. Try to imagine what it is that you read, watch, or listen to that doesn't travel part of the time over the electromagnetic spectrum. I don't think you can do it. Um, why should it matter for First Amendment purposes? Although under the laws it currently stands, it plainly does matter, but why should it matter whether a broadcast that is received in the home over electromagnetic spectrum wrapped inside a cable is also broadcast over non-cable and wrapped spectrum? This doctrine that the First Amendment has some special lesser application to whatever a court wants to label broadcast communication is really a recipe for central government control over all national communications media. Because every communications media fit can be described as a broadcasted medium today. And that seems to me to be the very antithesis of what the First Amendment was designed to protect. And there's a lot more about that in the last article I cite to you there, Krattenmaker and Poe, The Fairness Doctrine Today. Um, because I don't want to spend my whole time talking about the First Amendment, <laughs> I'll pass over that one and talk about my big idea, Section 2. Um, if we do need a National Indecency Commission or a National Board of Censors or a National Department of Rules Governing Polite Speaking, I don't think there's any public, any private or public body that's more ill-suited for such a role than the FCC. Um, the FCC, like me, and I suspect everyone else in this room except you, um, has no particular expertise in matters of taste, style, expressive behavior, or public decorum, nor should it. Here's a test for you. Suppose you wanted to know just what Yeats meant when he wrote this. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold. Or suppose you want to know what it signifies that Robert Frost ended stopping by woods on a snowy evening by repeating the final line, and miles to go before I sleep. So you remember that that poem ends, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. Before you read the 2001 indecency guidance from the FCC, where the agency told us that it was the commission's responsibility and duty to determine what was, quote, essential to the nature of an artistic work, would it ever have occurred to you to ask an FCC commissioner what those phrases meant? Many people in this room have personally known a commissioner. I see many who I think have known several. Maybe even a chairman. Is it not simply utterly preposterous that such people might claim that they have the ability to divine what is, quote, essential to the nature of an artistic work? And I mean no disrespect to them as human beings in saying that, because I can't do it either. Don't ask me <laughs> about the gyre and the falcon and things falling apart. I don't know from that. <laughs> All I know is Tom taught me da demand curve slope downward if you put price over here and quantity there, but they don't if you put quantity there and price over there. Those things I know, turning and turning in the widening gyre, I don't know from that. 
I guess that means I'm qualified to be a commissioner. Um, can you imagine the questions that would be asked at confirmation hearings if it got around Washington that this is what's going on down on 12th Street Southeast? The predecessor agency to the FCC, the Federal Radio Commission, recognized its own shortcomings. Wish the FCC had remembered this. <laughs> it, in its first annual report back in 1927, it lamented how difficult it was to, quote, measure the conflicting claims of grand opera and religious services of jazz orchestras and lectures on the diseases of hogs. And they said, we're really not up to that task. Now, commissioners worry over how to differentiate hog's breath, which I think is not indecent, from pig shit, which I think is presumptively indecent, if I read the regulations correctly. And fortunately, we have experts in the room who can correct me. Now, don't get me wrong. I have much respect for the FCC. I've even worked there and taken home a paycheck on a couple of occasions. The commission does demonstrably possess expertise in carrying out several tasks that Congress favors. Let me mention three of them that I think the Commission's very good at. For example, one thing the Commission is very good at is retarding technological progress. Okay? <laughs> Those of you who are, nobody in this room is as old as I am, but some of you who have read history may know about the 20 year war the Commission carried on to keep cable in its infancy forever, to squelch the cable uh, television industry. Um, those of you who are a little bit, you know, uh, maybe like half as old as I might remember, that when the commission first decided it was going to permit cellular telephony, it decided it would permit exactly two to a market. <laughs> cellular telephony was a natural duopoly. Maybe that turned out to be prescient the way things are going, <laughs> but at least um, but remember back when they used to require that receive only, only earth stations get a license from the FCC. This is a receive only earth station. All these had the advantage of retarding technological progress, which I think was a, a very happy thing up on Capitol Hill because that made the entrenched interests and their labor unions happy. They weren't being displaced so fast. The commission slows things down. Congress likes that. Another thing that, co that the commission is very good at and knows how to do is to redistribute wealth. Um, look at the so-called universal service and schools and library tax, where as, since you live in this area, you know that if you have telephone service, every month you pay a tax to subsidize the phone service of people who have 10,000 acre ranches in Wyoming. Um, and the and the internet access in the libraries of private country club schools to which you are sending your children. Um, the um, cable rate regulation was designed to take money from Peter and give it to Paul. The primetime access rule, which uh, governed network television or non-network television for a couple of decades, was designed to take money from the West Coast and give it to the East Coast in the production community and take money from networks and give it to local stations. And for those reasons, was much beloved on Capitol Hill. Um, and then, of course, there was the more than two-decade ban, <laughs> have we all forgotten this, on telephone companies offering cable service, <laughs> which was, again, intended to redistribute. Well, I mean, it, it almost seems laughable <laughs> in, um, in, in today's environment. Uh, so those are some examples of the commission's um, uh, demonstrably, uh, um, uh, demonstrable ability to, 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 re to do wealth redistribution. A third thing the Commission knows very well is how to set technical standards for equipment and communications interoperability. Um, remember AT&T's ban on foreign attachments? <laughs> um, uh, that's, that's no more. I think we're probably all to the good that that's, that, that that's no more. Each of these skills, I think, appears to be highly desired by Congress. What I notice is that none of these skills has any relationship to carrying out an indecency policy. The fact that you can do those three things doesn't mean that you're good at carrying out an indecency policy. What it does mean is if you possess those skills and are told to turn out an indecency policy, what are you going to do? You're going to turn out a set of indecency rules that look, guess what, like the FCC's interconnection rules. That's what you're going to get. Co-location, virtual co-location, outside location, here we go on indecency. 
you got to know the difference between literal and non-literal expletives. Okay, what Cher said, fuck them. What was that? Right, non-literal. She didn't really want to have sexual intercourse with her critics. <laughs> Unless she has some disease she wants to pass along. I don't think that's the case. You have to know the difference between fleeting and dwells upon. Okay, now that's hard because it turns out that approximately seven seconds isn't fleeting. <laughs> All right, <laughs> that's dwelling upon. Uh, and for a moment is also dwelling upon, at least if it's the side of a breast. Um, you have to know the difference between inherently indecent, fuck, shit, versus contextually indecent, bullshit. Okay, that's contextually indecent under the wrong circumstances. Um, the simple point, I think, is this. If we need a national enforcement policy against indecent public communications, we do not need the skill sets of the FCC technocracy to set and carry out that policy. Um, for the moment, I'm going to talk about why I don't think we should have an indecency law, but if you want to have one, I think the, right, I think the model is out there. If we must have one, it should be the same as for pornography, a federal statute enforced by U.S. attorneys who compare this issue with other pressing matters on their desk and see which ones need attention um, in front of juries and before reviewing courts. Uh, it wouldn't be the greatest legal feat since creation of the rule against perpetuities to construe the present indecency statutes as requiring just such a system of enforcement. Indeed, when it first came up in Pacifica, it looked like that might be an option. The indecency statute is written as though it's not an integral part of the Communications Act, but is a general part of federal law. It might help to do this little... Um, excuse me, judicial ledger domain to rely on separation of powers principles in the Constitution also, but I think it could be done. Um, now, however, I want to give you my big idea number three, which is we do not need a na national indecency law, whether for the broadcast medium or for any other mode of expression. And I think the reasons for that were well expressed 40 years ago in the court's decision in Cohen in California, and are ap aptly illustrated by the facts of these cases, as happens in every single indecency case you will ever see. So this is like falling off a log. This is really easy stuff to show. Cohen in California, 1971 decision about a guy who in 1968 walked into a trial into a municipal courthouse in Los Angeles wearing a jacket on which was written "fuck the draft." The court held he was engaged in constitutionally protected speech. Um, Along the way, it basically told us that any indecency rule is going to be, number one, inherently vague. You may remember, this, you all read Cohen when you were in law school, and certainly if you were a student of mine, I made you read it. Um, it is often true that one man's vulgarity is another's lyric. That's another way of just saying it's always going to be vague. It will always be employed solely or disproportionately against speech with which we disagree or cannot understand. If he had said on a street corner, fuck those North Vietnamese commies, there's no chance he would have been arrested. And most importantly, it's inevitably going to prevent speakers from being able to express cogently and clearly not only what they believe, but how passionately or sincerely they believe it. As the court said in Cohen, quote, we cannot indulge the facile assumption that one can forbid particular words without also running a substantial risk of suppressing ideas in the process. Or, along the same lines, likely to prevent speakers from talking directly to the audiences they wish to address. Um, as the, there's this wonderful phrase in the Pacific of dis dissent accusing the majority of acute ethnocentric myopia. <laughs> to think that you can carry out an indecency policy uh, that is in fact even-handed. Um, is to suffer acute ethnocentric myopia. All these things happened in this case. I'll demonstrate it now because I told you I can do it with any indecency case. Is it vague? Sure. What did Cher say? Fuck them. She didn't mean this literally. Why was that phrase covered? How is it that fuck them is more offensive than a sweater that looks like it was produced by a pumpkin mating with a turd? Huh? I mean, why is... I've read you that list. Wipe his ass, bullshit versus shit. 
um, it's it, it's always going to be it's going to be vague and it's going to leave people guessing at what it is they are able to say. What it does is it leads to an extraordinary amount of self censorship. Secondly, it's going to be discriminatory. If we're worried about children, which is what I'm told about in decency law when it comes to broadcast, what's the difference between fucking brilliant? which is what another one of these shows where a guy receives an award and he says, this is fucking brilliant. What's the difference between that and erectile dysfunction? Which one is going to be harder for you to deal with your, I'm thinking right now of our six-year-old granddaughter, <laughs> saying, what does that mean, pop-pop? <laughs> okay? I, to me, it's the best to tie. <laughs> and how is it that shit is inherently indecent while bullshit is not? There is something special about bulls <laughs> to children. <laughs> it's, it's good they should learn about bulls. And talk about the impact on the speaker. Could there be a better illustration of how an indecency regime affects people's ability to communicate? What they're telling is Cher should have said, this will show my critics instead of fuck them. Now, <laughs> which of those makes the point better, but more importantly, which makes the point Cher wanted to make, and if you also think about the audience she was trying to address. So to, to, to call this a kind of a non-censorious regime, I think is to miss the whole point about language and about what the court and Cohen talked about, the emotive as well as the cognitive function that speech provides. Um, I don't think this is a trivial matter just because it involves cussing. Um, many of you probably will, and it's a fair point. I, 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 I can understand somebody saying that. Um, I've become somewhat of a cottage industry in the last few years, <laughs> writing articles and giving speeches about why cussing ought to be protected under the First Amendment, so you might claim I've got a conflict of interest here. But I really don't think it's a trivial matter. Here's what the court said in Cohen about that. Quote, the constitutional right of free expression is powerful medicine in a society as diverse and populous as ours. To many, the immediate consequence of this freedom, freedom may often appear to be only verbal tumult, discord, and even offensive utterance. These are, however, in truth, necessary side effects of the broader enduring values which the process of open debate permits us to achieve. We cannot lose sight of the fact that in what otherwise might seem a trifling and annoying instance of individual distasteful abuse of a privilege, these fundamental societal values are truly implicated. In my view, a sincere belief in the enduring values of the First Amendment, values that were expressed not only in Cohen, uh, but in every indecency case since Cohen, from flag burning to military funeral picketing, demands that the finding that Cher's behavior was indecent must be reversed. Um, and whatever you think about obscenity law, if that NYPD episode was not porn, it was not censorable. Um, I'm particularly discouraged by a somewhat smaller point. I think that every member of the court, save Justice Ginsburg, who dissented from the Fox opinion, I think every member of the court agrees with everything I've said about why we don't need a National Indecency Commission, but thinks that we do need to have one or that we should tolerate one for, quote, broadcasting, unquote, whatever that is. Um, for me, it's harder to imagine a shallower position on the indecency issue. <laughs> we should have the FCC outlaw broadcast indecency even though we cannot, de we cannot define the word broadcast and the commission cannot define indecency. Um, nevertheless, if we're looking for an award for the shallowest argument in Fox, you might try this one. <laughs> this is a footnote. The very first argument made in the Supreme Court by the United States in the oral argument was that we need to save an indecency regime for radio, whatever that is. That was the lead-off argument from the government, which had the lead argument. It's FCC against Fox. First point was, we got to save indecency for radio. Think about that, folks. A -M I, I, I look, I'm sure there's an awful lot of parents in here. How many of you have children listen to radio? Huh? <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> yeah, right. Over the Internet, right? 
Oh, really? Okay. Sports radio. Sports radio. Okay, there you go. And and then somebody says the fucking coach, and that comes under the bona fide news exception. <laughs> so that's not indecent. Yeah, it's the erectile dysfunction. Yeah, it's the erectile dysfunction that gets him. Okay. Um, all of this um, kvetching uh, leads me to my big idea number four. Um, and my big idea number four is if the Supreme Court is going to proclaim itself the sole arbiter of what our First Amendment means to our modern democratic society, it needs to act like a court and earn the right to be thought of as supreme. And I think that means two things at a minimum. Number one, take responsibility for developing a coherent body of free speech doctrine, a doctrine that can be applied by inferior tribunals and without regard to the politics, preferences, or predilections of the day. And number two, acquire at least a passing familiarity with how facts and ideas are assembled and communicated in the modern communications marketplace. Seems to me if you want to say, I am the Supreme Court when it comes to mass communications, you ought to be able to do those two things and take responsibility for them. This is precisely, I think, the opposite of what the court did in FCC against Fox. Um, I'm going to look at, first of all, the questions the justices asked in oral argument and then talk a little bit about the way they disposed of the case. Um, you will have to decide this for your own. Read the oral argument. I did. It's fairly short. I've got the transcript here, actually, if anybody wants to copy it. It was consumed by three questions or hypothetical positions posed by one or more justices. I'd say the majority of it was taken up with one of these three topics. One, the networks are subject to regulation of what they say, regulation that transcends normal First Amendment norms because they were, quote, given a privilege, unquote, or enjoy, quote, free spectrum, unquote. Um, it must have been pretty tough for the gentleman arguing the case for the networks to know where to start with questions like that. <laughs> um, we got time to think about it. I'll just mention a few things that at least I would have wanted to say back. Um, Probably, as I think most of you know by now, most of the ABC affiliates and most of the Fox affiliates paid for their spectrum. <laughs> they probably bought their station from somebody else. These are not the original grantees we're talking about. They also, the majority of their viewers, are over cable, and they have entered into a commercial deal to get carried on cable. Yes, help by must carry, no doubt about that. That's the Supreme Court's fault that we'll get into another day. Um, Alternatively, I, could, I imagined the network lawyers wanting to say, well, nobody gave us the transmitter. <laughs> nobody gave us the electricity. Nobody gave us the programming. We paid for all those things. What is this free stuff? Or maybe one would have wanted to respond, what speaker does not enjoy a privilege from the government? Sidewalk speakers have sidewalks. Magazines have mailing privileges. Newspapers enjoy sidewalk vending racks. All printers enjoy the protection of state property and trespass laws so that Mr. Tornillo cannot walk in there at night and reset the type and have his right of reply editorial covered. What communicator doesn't enjoy, forgive me for sending like President Obama, doesn't enjoy some privilege um, and then the other question I suppose that occurs is, well, should the burden have some connection to the privilege conferred? Could the FCC tell the networks to build playgrounds for children? Um, is there, what is this throwing out its free spectrum got to do with indecency, or does it have to do with everything? It means there's an infinite variety of burdens that can be put upon the networks because they have a privilege in the form of free spectrum. These are a number of ways of saying that I don't find those kind, that kind of question to be very illuminating <laughs> or to suggest that there's much understanding uh, among the, these, the, the, this super court that we're talking about here about modern communications technology. A second kind of question that came up a lot uh, is, is or it's a sort of a position. There is neither a right to say fuck nor right 
not to say fuck. It all depends on the context in which the indecent word or words are uttered. All they're doing is saying, let's talk about context. Um, we went over the beginning part pretty fast, and so you're going to have to trust me a little bit. This is almost exactly the opposite of what the commission said. The commission had said, when it comes at least to fuck and shit, we don't look at context. They are just per se offensive. Um, and it's a little bit disconcerting to see someone raising this question three different times in the oral argument when I think the right answer was, that's not so. It is true, as I pointed out, the commission said we do have two exceptions, the bona fide news and then the, the essential to uh, uh, an artistic work. Um, the question that was never followed up is who gets to determine what contexts are permissible? Um, why would it be assumed that the FC, FCC is the one that's going to determine what is a permissible context? Um, and, to de- and who is going to determine on review whose culture predominates? Shares culture or the culture of the chair of the FCC? Uh, there's a third type of question that came up a lot that goes like this. If we permit these broadcasts, won't the television universe be flooded with similarly indecent broadcast materials? It's like you, 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 you got your, the FCC's got its fingers in the dike, <laughs> if that's the image you want to have, or they're building a wall against a flood of indecency. Um, there are a couple things about this. Um, if you think about it, and I know you don't spend your time reading free speech cases all the time, and unfortunately I do spend a lot of my time doing that, this question is never asked in other free speech cases. Nobody ever said how many flags are going to be burned if we go this way in Texas against Johnson. Won't everybody be out there burning their flag tomorrow? Nobody ever said, isn't everybody going to go buy a fuck the draft jacket? And why didn't more people do it? I mean, I don't know why you can't find this on the boardwalk. You know, I mean, I think it would be a great. (laughs) I was that we 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 take our granddaughter to the seashore every summer, a privilege, and we like to go to Ocean City, New Jersey. And I remember after the Eagles um, signed Michael Vick, there was hide your beagle, Vick's an eagle. (laughs) I thought that was pretty clever, but you couldn't get a fuck the draft shirt. Um, Well, anyway. the court didn't say how many military funerals are going to be picketed distastefully as a result of our decision here. And this is not the way First Amendment jurisprudence is carried out, except this question got asked over and over. Um, the other thing is, even if it's somehow relevant in this context but not in others, you know the answer to it. You know the answer to it. Look at cable. <laughs> For reasons that maybe we don't understand, because of cases like ACLU against Reno, th- nobody's got an argument that you can apply this indecency policy to cable networks uh, or to material that's broadcast solely over the Internet. And so what do you find? You find an abundance of children's channels and of adult channels. You find a lot of people going around saying fuck and shit and wipe his ass and da da da. You also find a host of channels out there where you would never hear this stuff uttered. Um, And you find every one of them labeled. Um, What happens there is the people who watch choose, and that's what happens in every other medium of communication in this country. Um, And somehow these questions... They predominate. I mean, is it like go through the oral argument and find me another question that's get, that gets asked more than once, or with anything like the the the, uh, uh, the the sense of gravitas behind it of these three. Well, having wasted almost the entire oral argument on trivial or off-point questions like these, the court then decided it wished it had never granted certiorari. Um, instead of dismissing the writ, however, it put down an opinion that could have been written without any study of the briefs or any oral argument, (laughs) saying there wasn't enough notice about this kind of behavior in this case given back at that time. Probably correct, by the way, um, but you didn't need the Supreme Court to say that, and the Second Circuit had already said it's unconstitutionally vague. And then, after they wrote that, they then vacated the reasoned judgment of the Second Circuit without a single word critiquing that court's opinion. Um, 
I'm tempted to say um, the court labored mightily and brought forth a mouse, but I'm afraid the National Indecency Commission <laughs> would get would would find that a patently offensive depiction of sexual or excretory activity. Um, so the um, I, I, I'll leave it to others to tell me exactly what the legal status of all this is right now. Because they vacated the Second Circuit's ruling, I think this means we have reinstated the Commission's indecency policy, and in a sense, there's now nothing wrong with, or at least nothing adjudicated wrong with, either the chair, uh, I'm sorry, the chair decision or the NYPD decision, um, because the Second Circuit judgment is gone, and um, that means, I guess, that we start all over again? <laughs> um, well, let me stop. Uh, one might say Fox is a small case. Who cares about seven seconds of nude buttocks one way or the other? Um, in a showing of humility, that is very rare for me, so I hope you're getting this on tape. Uh, I'm going to give the next to last word on that issue to somebody else. In this Sunday's Washington Post, George Washington law professor Jonathan Turley wrote this, the very right that laid the foundation for Western civilization, the right of freedom of speech, is increasingly viewed as a nuisance, if not a threat, unquote. Um, I couldn't have said it better, so I got mad about FCC against Fox. Uh, now, also, by the way, I've covered all the Georges. <laughs> Fernando mentioned I used to teach at Georgetown. Here I am at George Mason, quoting a George Washington law professor. All the, all, all the George legal beagles have been covered, okay? Um, in my own words, not Professor Turley's, I think there are four big reasons why Fox is a big case and why every justice who participated in it, save, I have to say, save Justice Ruth Ginsburg, who refused to join the opinion while calling for the overruling of Pacifica. I think that every other justice who participated in that case ought to be embarrassed by what they did with it. And I told you I'd stop by 5 o'clock, so I just did. Or would you like to hear the other 20 page? <laughs> Do we need to hand out the microphones? Yeah. While the mics are being handed out, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm giving gonna, the floor to Fernando, but I'll be—I mean, I'll respond to questions, but he's going to manage the <coughs> debate or the debacle. I'm the censor. Yeah. <laughs> is Tom's microphone on? Oh, yeah. you got your—is your? Is your mobile. You're mobile. Now you can. Now you can piss. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. So while those are being handed out, so we can grab it for the tape, I'm sure this won't be the most interesting question, but. Um, I want to ask you about the New York Times article uh, that you were interviewed for oh. regarding Cohen and, and advocacy. So as, as a lawyer, I want to ask this question about you, – you mentioned all these, these words. You use words. You use expression in your argument to us. Um, I noticed – I read the transcript um, in, the, in the Fox case, and those, none of that really came up. Um, the court has uh, admonished all the counsel appearing before it in these cases – not you know they're familiar with the facts. Don't don't mention these words. Exactly. Can you tell us a little bit about sure. your view on that? Yeah, um, the I'm told I didn't check this out. I'm told that the oral argument in the Second Circuit was really quite a cussing match. <laughs> oh, that's true. That, uh, is it true? We, did you see? Okay, thank you, Rick. What? Oh, okay. And the and the words were just being thrown. Yeah, it was like sailors on a. <laughs> okay, there you go. Right, my kind of place. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and, um, but I have it on what I think is good authority. I'm not going to quote Rick on this. I'm not going to ask him to because it was, for, but the, the law, in this case, the lawyers asked the court, may we use the words during the oral argument? And the answer came back from the court, no. Um, uh, I know that that means that I would have said, well, then we're not going to do oral argument. And we've written our briefs and we don't, then we don't have anything to add. Um, when the fellow argued the case in Cohen in California, Chief Justice Berger, that's the fuck the draft on the jacket, the Chief Justice said at the very beginning, you can go look at the transcript, says, counsel, you may assume that everybody is familiar with the facts of the case and get right to your argument. And, and the counsel said, essentially, 
Uh, yes, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, I understand. Uh, as we all know, Mr. Cohen walked into a courthouse wearing a jacket saying, fuck the draft. <laughs> um, you, when you think about it, you can't argue that Mr. Cohen can walk into a court with that jacket if you can't stand in a court and say the word fuck. So um, uh, it was argued by, uh, by the way, by the way, a very, very famous and very competent law professor from the West Coast. I always go to school at UCLA, I believe, but David Nimmer, who's a, a very, very talented intellectual property scholar, but also First Amendment scholar. Um, so in between that, we have these other cases, and the fellow who covers the um, court for the Times um, wrote, an, wrote an article. Um, I guess it was before this case was decided, yeah, it was before. right? Mm -hmm. And he said, as I recall, Fernando, didn't you look it up? That in these indecency cases, when counsel doesn't use the word... They lose. They lose. <laughs> and it happened again. You can read the transcript of oral argument, and there's not... There, there, you will hear every once in a while somebody will say the F word. Or they'll say something, but that's all they will say. They don't say fuck, they say the F word. And so the that... Track record remains unbroken, right? If yeah. you don't say it, you lose. It's good, good for lawyers. Adam. <laughs> uh, I'm Adam Thier with the Mercatus Center here at George Mason University. So I'd like to go back to the two corollaries of your fourth principle, your fourth big idea. You said that the Supreme Court, uh, in order to act like a court and be, or earn the right to be called supreme, needs to develop, one, a coherent body of free speech jurisprudence, and secondly, uh, understand how mass communication works. Yeah. Um, so those are excellent principles, and I think we could argue, and would you agree, that they have indeed met those goals for everything except for broadcast. Oh. So if you look at ACLU versus Reno, which you mentioned, you look at the COPA decision, both what they did for the Internet, you look at the Playboy decision, what it meant for uh, multi-channel video, you look at the Brown versus EMA for video games, we have a very coherent body of First Amendment jurisprudence based on the principle if there's less restrictive means available for people to deal with yeah. these things, then the law must yield to that. Wish I'd thought about that point, and I'd probably put it, I'd run on for another 10 minutes. Right, <laughs> so not, if, if that's the case, here's, here, uh, have we just firewalled off broadcasting to basically keep everything else safe? I guess so, but I don't know. I mean, Bruce, you don't have to comment on this if you don't want to. What's running through my mind is the must-carry decision. <laughs> is that, to be explained again, it's under the broadcast firewall? Or is that a failure to understand cable and understand how cable gets programming on it? I mean, if you, in, in the, it's all laid out in Justice O'Connor's dissent in the, in the Musk Carey case. That was a content specific regulation <laughs> where Congress said, we want to make sure that you have to carry all our ads when we're running for office <laughs> and that you have to carry the ads of the car dealers who give us money to run for Congress. And the Supreme Court said, that's a great idea. We love it, five to four. Um, so every, every, out of everything you said fits, how do you, what do you want to say about most carry? Right. Yeah, I don't know. Right. Uh, do, having been semi-called on? I don't disagree. You don't disagree? Okay. What a brave man. So um, why isn't it, I mean, what about, what about kids, though? Isn't the, isn't the reaching in to the home, isn't all the discussion about the kids really where... Well, you could, that's right. You could say There's no that, flag burning. You, you could There's say no... this has got nothing to do with broadcast. That's exactly right. What this is is um, go up there and say it's for the children, and the court will say, oh, my God, you can have whatever you want. <laughs> And it's a... But that hasn't been the case for the internet, uh, but, but, right? Or video not, games. No, going. it has not been. I mean, that's the... the I, I, going, I, going's walking around the street, yeah. kids see that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, re I remember there's, there's a... Uh, back when they used to... When they started, before you had the ratings for movies, the so-called voluntary rating system, a lot of localities had adopted rating policies saying you can't let children into this movie. This is early 60s. And so there's a, there's a law review article, and I can't remember whether it's one I wrote or one I cited. It's, I think it's one I cited. I wish I'd called it. It's called, Is the First Amendment for Adults Only? And these things were gathering some steam. Before that, we had comic book censorship that was said to be for children, that you're just keeping these things out of the hands of children. Um, so that's all done I think that would be, that's almost like a parallel universe, and it's... Um, it, it, it's it's an utterly fair question. Uh, here's how I will defend myself this way. 
Hazlett told me I have to finish in time to get to the reception, so I didn't put in a fifth principle about why. <laughs> this stuff about protecting children is just a lot of hogwash. I mean, why is it? I, I think about, I thought that maybe when I gave this talk, I had to put, we, we, we do have a six-year-old granddaughter whom we love dearly, and she lives only 14 miles from our house. If I put a picture of Lily Catherine Grattenmaker up here and say, do I really think she should be subjected to all this stuff? And the answer is no. But she shouldn't be subjected to ring around the collar or erectile dysfunction or wars in Afghanistan and Iraq either. But um, we have to deal with this. Do you have any comments on the uh, kiosks in the metro? Anita, they want you to get on the. Do you have any comment on the. Requirement, Anita Walgren, the requirement that Metro actually put up the um, privately purchased ads regarding the, the uh, Israel. Um, could everybody hear? I, I think you could. Just put your hands up if you don't hear it. I usually repeat questions, but I, it sounded to be like it was. It was. The question was that: What do I think about the recent controversy about Metro being required to carry ads that um, that could be said to be? Uh, among other things, offensive to people from the Middle East or to Muslims or to or or, or to other than Jewish people, um, and I guess I would I mean I would say it seems to me the law's pretty clear. <laughs> Metro's a public agency; it's determined to open itself to 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 these kinds of advertisements, right. and I don't think it's allowed to choose right. uh, so. any more than the president of Gallia Debt ought to be allowed to choose. Um, which political causes his uh, his employees support? I don't think Metro can 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 be dis uh, um, allowed to make that choice. But this is where. I mean, let me say this. Uh, um, I really did mean when I broke it down into indecency and the FCC. Maybe we do need an indecency. We have a pornography law. I don't think I'm in favor of that either. But we're not talking about that today. If we need an indecency regulation, one thing I like a lot about your question, Anita, is I think it tells us it wouldn't be broadcast specific. Right. <laughs> it wouldn't be broadcast specific. Somebody standing out in front of your home yelling vicious lies about you, <laughs> that kind of person might be caught by a properly constructed indecency law. Would this be somebody in your family? <laughs> or <just> <laughs> <laughs> For you and me, it'd be somebody in the family, Tom, but, you know, Anita's not, not the kind of person you and I are. Quiet, dear. Touche. Yeah. Well, if I can just say, you started out at the beginning and, and immediately provoked my, my thinking about this because you know better than everybody that there are many other time, place, and manner restrictions, oh, yeah. other kinds of reasons, and you singled out that what's wrong here is that the, the law has just gone for the broadcast technology. Yes, two things. Yes, so singled out broadcasting, and this is content specific. So, are, that's the, so are you really against any kind of content specific uh, uh, regulation? Uh, any kind of content specific yeah, regulation? Yeah, because where I wanted to bring up something well, like not. this objectionable, this difficult. Right. No, I mean a good example of content specific regulation that um, I a good example. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not in favor of this. Uh, sort of hateful, libelous, personal speech that's slanderous um, and said in private doesn't fall under the umbrella of New York Times and Sullivan. I don't see why the state can't publish okay. concrete harm that's done by action like that. Uh, the Supreme Court has said time and time again that, uh, that, that falsity has no protection under the First Amendment. I think that's generally true. And um, one of the places that we First Amendment libertines which I was accused by my friend Matt Spitzer of being when he saw my notes for this thing. Um, one of the things we run up against is commercial speech is a hard mm -hmm. doctrine. I also used to be an assistant director of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the FTC when I was in my 20s. <laughs> and we used to go out after these false, false claims. Uh, and I guess I still think we were right, but it re requires some more thoughts. So oh, by no means, I don't think the fact that it's content neutral means the kiss of death. But I think we have a well-developed doctrine about that stuff, and I think it says that you have to have a compelling governmental interest that's being carried out, in, at least if we're not talking about commercial speech, that's being achieved in, a, if not the least restrictive way, in, 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 a, in a way that is, that is well-tailored to achieve that objective. 
and it's got to be an, object, an objective that's consistent with the purposes underlying the value of freedom of speech. Um, and sometimes content restrict, uh, restrictions on, on speech are of that. Um, uh, just to give you one more example, I mean, leaking somebody's personnel file. That's speech, it's communication, right? But, I don't, I don't, I, 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 it's never occurred to me that that's likely to be protected by the First Amendment, although I don't know, I could work on that if I had to. WikiLeaks. You got, you, yeah, yeah, WikiLeaks. Yeah, I'm thinking maybe what I might find in Hazlitt's file. Nothing. <laughs> 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 well, somebody raise hand. Did, did you expect something different from the bong hits? Court? Did you did you think that they Bond would have? Bond hits for Jesus. Yes, that's a great example about the children stuff. Okay, that um, uh, guy's standing outside a school, as I recall, and there's a um, it's a school assembly or something going on. He holds up a sign that says "Bong hits for Jesus," Jesus, and gets uh, punished for it. And this, it goes all the way to the Supreme Court, and they uphold his dis the disciplinary action, and. Um, one of the things, of course, that I find, that's the only First Amendment case I know of where it's assumed that there's speech involved, although nobody can tell me what it says. <laughs> okay, bong hits for Jesus. Work that out, folks. Remember how you had to diagram sentences when you were in the sixth grade? Subject, verb, <laughs> adverb, da, da, da. bong hits for Jesus. What does that say? It's, it's a collection of words. <laughs> but... It's bong hits, right? So I guess it's like Cohen just standing there with fuck. Um, but uh, they just blow it off on the grounds that it's children's stuff. I mean, I guess Adam would be the first to say if that had been on some internet website. Huh? It's protected under ACLU and Reno, isn't it? Yeah. Tom. Yeah, Tom Hazlett. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Do you need the mic to be captured? Are we recording? Yes. Yeah. So you sure you want to ask that question? Yeah, so, the, well, uh, no, but we'll, we'll, we'll do it anyway. Um, so, I mean, the reason this stuff goes to broadcasting, or it doesn't go elsewhere, and why it's so specialized, is because of Pacifica yes. and Red Lion. Yes. They're both sitting there yes. as attractive businesses, uh, you might say. <laughs> and, uh, and nobody wants to defend either opinion now. Right. The court only wants to sidestep right. either opinion now. And, it's nice that Ginsburg sort of called the bluff of the court. Uh, maybe bluff is the wrong word. They just don't seem so concerned with it. But, I mean, uh, Sarah O oh and Drew Clark and, uh, uh, and I published a paper a couple years ago called The Overly Active Corpse of Red Lion, where we urged the court right. in the Fox case to, to take a look at Red Lion. And, and to straighten that out. I mean, we're literally sitting here in a day where the New York Times, with all of its First Amendment protections, comes to us exactly the same way broadcasting comes to us, through a, a pervasive wireless connection yeah. that's available to kids and everybody else. Sure. Okay. And so this whole thing about the technology makes wireless unique, different, and creates a whole new standard, that is so violently at odds with, you know, this, the, the, the facts in the market today. And you've been on this for, you know, 20 years with, with the convergence idea. Yeah. And here it's just all in front of us, and the court just doesn't know how to deal with that without going back and, and, uh, and overturning those precedents. Well, that's why, uh, Tom, I, I, obviously I agree with what you've said, but in order to stir up a little bit of controversy, I'll pick around the edges a little bit on that. Um, the, uh, this is what I mean when I call, I forget whether it's written in the principle or it's written in the description of what the talk is going to be about, but this is the, the, the postmodernist court. <laughs> what you're describing is a court that says, we would like to come out this way, we can't figure out how to say it, so we're just going to do it. Um, uh, we, we don't have any more responsibility than the president or the Congress for articulating why we think something, for saying why we've chosen some certain values, for saying why we've ch chosen certain rules. And I think that is, I mean, you know, sorry, maybe this is because I work for Republican justice. I don't know what it is, but to me, that's just wrong. I mean, the idea that this is why 
we call it the Supreme Court. It seems to be it's neither Supreme nor Court if what it's doing is just in, indulging in a lot of, oh, let's let that go, let's let not let that go, let's do that, and call us sometime if you want to know what our reasons are, but we're probably just going to stonewall you. So I think, I, I, I agree that's probably what, what's going on, and I think they should be ashamed of it. I think that's the word I used. The other thing is, there's a real difference in my view, and I think you and I may have some differences here, between Pacifica and Red Lion. There's nothing in Red Lion that permits what was going on in Pacifica. The simple way to put it is Red Lion was all an argument about expanding access, about diversifying views, about irrigating the vast wasteland. Now, I agree that Red Lion is wrong, but I think for a different reason. Pacifica is about keeping people off, making it conform, putting everything into a homogeneous cookie cutter. The, what, what the court has managed to do between the two cases is to embrace both principles. <laughs> um, and, I mean, that's a, re that's a real heck of a feat. The, 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 the fundamental difficulty with, um, with Red Lion, in, what Red Lion and Pacifica both do that's, that's, that I think is wrong, that they share in common, is to rest on the assumption that there's something different called broadcasting <laughs> that we could define Maybe that was something that was true in the late 60s, maybe even the late 70s. I don't even think it's arguable today. I think it's like there's only eight people in, in, in Washington who don't know it's not true, and they're all sitting on the Supreme Court. Eight because I don't include Justice Ginsburg in that group. So, uh, yeah, I think um, this... Pacifica, I'm, I'm sorry, Red Lion can't be explained by an infatuation with children's rights. Um, so it's just to try to figure out sort of what's going on with each one is really a different kind of issue unless what they're doing is saying, as I kind of threw in there, well, we have a surprise for the networks. <laughs> you don't have any First Amendment rights. That's not a surprise, but we're going to give you Fifth Amendment rights. And, of course, any network executive, if required to choose, will take the fifth because there's a just compensation clause in there. <laughs> These guys are much more interested in the money than in the freedom of speech. But question about that'll be, that'll be another talk. Have me back for that one. Tim? You said I get to ask a question after Tom. Yes. You have to identify yourself. Oh, I'm, oh Tim Brennan, uh, UMBC. Um, I just want to try to understand the nature of the argument here. Not, not so much, I, I don't disagree with you or Adam about the single out of broadcasting. It doesn't even make a lot of sense. Let me give a hypothetical on the children's side of this. Sure. Posing it kind of in economic terms. One could imagine a cost-benefit calculation of a sort, where on the one hand, you could say that, that some kind of government indecency regulation reduces the cost of parents of policing what it is their children seek. Right. And you could, in principle, you could add that up. And there's a, but there's a downside to that, which is that you interfere with other stuff other people are willing to say or see, and that presumably there's a willingness to pay numbers that could be hooked on that. Or let their children hear or see. Yeah, if, that they may not care. Right, that's what they, they, mean, they, they may prefer something else. That's right. And so, um, and so one could, so you got a bunch of numbers in the other ledger, and you could do a cost-benefit analysis in principle, and see which one is bigger. The question is, is, is your argument that, that if you were to do that, the cons of indecent, you know, the, the numbers on the don't do it, on the don't intervene side of the ledger are bigger than the, than the, than the helping parents outside of the ledger, and that's what the basis should be, or is the argument that it doesn't matter how that number would come out, these in your phrase, sort of broader, enduring values in some sense trump it. You know, yes. if there's a former, I mean, or another way to sort of phrase it maybe, should, should the Supreme Court, especially taking your last point into, your last big idea into account, should they be doing cost-benefit analysis at all? Yeah. Well, now, that, that question I don't want to, should they be doing cost-benefit analysis at all, that's too much. But yes, thank you. Um, and uh, Tim is so sweet, you even wrote it down, in broader enduring values. Yes. yes. I don't know how to put it in e e economic terms, but it is, what I believe is, we made a pre-commitment. 
Mm -hmm. We said before we start doing that counting, we're not going to do it. It's called the First Amendment, and we're not going to do it because you're going to get different answers at different times with different people. But what we know is that in the long run, how about that for economics? Mm. Don't talk to me about short run. Talk to me about long run. In the long run, we don't want to have a national censorship board for indecency. Okay. I mean, you might want to have, for other things, you might well want to have. We have a Federal Trade Commission for lying about products. I think I'm on that program. So, so anyway, yeah, the, the short answer to your question, did you want to go ahead and build a hypothetical off that? Yeah, I'm talking about um, real pie in the sky stuff, it, broader enduring values, not trying to, then it, 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 if you mean for your question about cost-benefit analysis, um, I haven't thought about that enough, Tim. I mean, I'll, here's, a, here's an obvious example. Where the court is doing Fourth Amendment freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, I don't know how you do that without some cost-benefit analysis mm -hmm. in the modern era. Okay, if you're talking about electronic surveillance or you're talking about, about putting a GPS device on somebody's car, to go back to an original understanding or something about that, it's kind of hard for me to imagine that you wouldn't be looking at the, the degree of intrusion into privacy, the alternatives that were available, law enforcement, yada, 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 as part of the analysis. For most free speech issues, I don't think so. But on this one, for, what, for whatever it's worth, that, that, that is my argument. And I thank you for asking the question. You have exposed me as a hopeless romantic. Did you want to cite the Tornillo decision where the court yeah. explicitly says there is no cost benefit on this? Yeah. We're going to cut this short. This yeah. analysis about monopoly of yeah. timing Yeah, but, but, I'm, I, but I'm buying in the Fernando's thing, which is because this, just because the Supreme Court said it doesn't mean it's right. <laughs> so, in other words, I, if, I, if I'm going to tell them you got to get it right in Fox, then I'm not allowed to say, well, but you said in Tornillo. Okay, so I think Tornillo's right, but Tim made me explain why I think it's right. So that, okay, yeah. And next time you want to do something like that, turn your microphone on. <laughs> I, I don't know whether uh, Ju Chief Justice Roberts said it in, in oral argument, so I'm not going to quote him as saying it, although I'm pretty sure he did when I read the transcript, but Rick will probably correct me if I'm wrong. Um, something which to me strikes, strikes sounds like cost-benefit, or it's protecting kids, where he says something like, this is just about creating a safe haven for kids. It's 8 o'clock, can't parents put them in front of the TV and not expose them to nudity? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it seems like it's a crude way of saying, what's the big deal? Yeah. And what's the big deal is my kind of economic reasoning. Right, right, right. Um, primitive and, and, you know, yeah. isn't he saying, like, forget the values, what's the big deal? I, I think it was Kennedy who said it, but I do remember at that point, I mean, the, the at least in the Maybe it's at another point. Somebody said, just like in this court, <laughs> we say, and it turned out they had already said it, don't come in here and say fuck or shit or whatever. And Scalia immediately says, sign me up for that view, that this is just sort of, uh, I don't know, developing some sort of a pristine platform. A safe haven. Like that. Or, or, or a safe haven or uh, whatever it would be. And um, I just don't... I. I it's, um, let me see now, why is it hard for me to respond to that? It's because I don't know what you couldn't justify with an argument like that. <laughs> um, that argument says that we need to have a national culture commission, or we're perfectly entitled to have one, to put a bunch of bureaucrats or legislators in charge of national culture because we're afraid otherwise that there's not going to be a safe haven for children. And I just don't know how you can say that while you are looking in the face of <laughs> the First Amendment. Well, that was a little pompous. Wasn't that was it? good, Tom. Uh, are there other questions? Because we're at the 530. And please join me then in thanking Tom for his lecture, Big Ideas, and we will join you downstairs for refreshments. Thank you all. Thank you. I clap for you all. Thank you. It was fun. Thank you. <laughs>